In the world of crime, few stories are as shocking or as disturbing as that of Peter Bryan, a man whose horrific acts of violence and cannibalism left a deep scar on the United Kingdom. A man released from a psychiatric facility only to unleash unimaginable horror upon his victims. How could a dangerous individual slip through the cracks of the mental health system, leaving innocent lives in his wake? In today's video, we dive deep into the chilling case of Peter Bryan, a killer whose madness knew no bounds. Prepare yourself for a story that will leave you questioning the limits of human evil. Peter Bryan was born in 1969 in London, England, to immigrant parents from Barbados. His family had moved to England in the 1950s in search of a better life. Peter was the youngest of seven children. Unfortunately, the family's life in England wasn't an easy one. His parents worked every single day, leaving Peter and his siblings to be cared for by Mendes. His mother, in particular, was absent for large stretches of Peter's childhood, as she spent considerable time in Barbados with her older children, who had not immigrated to England. Because of this, Peter grew up largely unsupervised. Peter's behavior was troubling from an early age. While attending Shaftesbury Junior School in Forest Gate, he developed a reputation as a bully. He picked on children smaller than him, stealing their lunch money and generally making their lives miserable. There were reports that Peter forced other children to tie his shoelaces and took every opportunity to demean others. His bullying tendencies worsened as he grew older. As a teenager, Peter joined a street gang and began experimenting with drugs at the age of 12. Experts believe that his early substance abuse severely impacted his mental development, which may have contributed to his later psychosis. There was also a family history of mental illness, suggesting a genetic predisposition to his violent behavior. Peter's conduct deteriorated further when he attended Trinity Secondary School in Canning Town. Teachers reported that he seemed to enjoy hurting others and controlling them. His violent tendencies escalated as he committed thefts, harassed classmates, and even physically assaulted a female teacher. However, despite his increasingly dangerous behavior, Peter only received a suspension. He continued at the school until he dropped out at the age of 15. By the time he was 18 years old, Peter's life was already on a downward spiral. In 1987, he had his first major run-in with the law when he attempted to throw another resident out of a sixth-floor window at the Flying Angel, a hostel in East London where he was staying. The attack was completely unprovoked, suggesting Peter was already experiencing severe psychotic episodes. Despite this, the police took no action, missing an opportunity to intervene before his behavior escalated further. On March 18, 1993, Peter Bryan committed his first known murder. At the time, he was working as a shop assistant for the Sheth family, who owned a clothing store in London. The Sheths were an affluent Indian family who had taken Peter and despite his erratic behavior. Peter had developed an infatuation with Nisha Sheth, the family's 20-year-old daughter. His behavior toward her was often inappropriate, and he made her deeply uncomfortable with his unwanted advances. Nisha's mother, Mrs. Sheth, also became increasingly concerned about Peter's behavior. He had once stolen a hammer from their tool shed and had even told her that he wanted to kill someone. Mrs. Sheth reported this to her husband, but Mr. Sheth didn't believe that Peter was a danger. Unfortunately, his trust in Peter would cost the family dearly. After Nisha caught Peter stealing clothes from their shop, she reported him to her father. Peter felt betrayed by Nisha's actions and decided to exact a brutal revenge. One week later, he showed up at the store armed with a claw hammer. He first attacked Nisha's 12-year-old brother, knocking him aside before turning his attention to Nisha. He struck her repeatedly with the hammer, hitting her so hard that part of her brain was exposed. Nisha died from the severe head trauma. Peter fled the scene but was eventually apprehended. He was charged with murder, and during his trial, he claimed diminished responsibility due to his deteriorating mental state. In 1994, Peter was sentenced to an indefinite stay at Rampton Secure Hospital, a facility for mentally ill offenders. Despite the Sheth family's pleas for a harsher sentence, Peter was diagnosed with schizophrenia, 
and the courts ruled that he should remain in the hospital for treatment. Peter Bryan remained at Rampton Secure Hospital for seven years, where he was treated for his schizophrenia. For a time, it seemed that his condition was improving. He began to behave better, and his doctors believed he was no longer a danger to society. In 2001, Peter was transferred to the Riverside Hostel, a minimum security facility in London, where he was allowed to come and go as he pleased. Despite showing signs of improvement, Peter continued to exhibit troubling behavior. He was caught using drugs and, on one occasion, assaulted a 17-year-old girl by blowing raspberries on her stomach. Although the police were called, nothing significant came from the incident. Peter was moved to an open ward at Newham General Hospital for his own safety after the girl's family threatened him. On February 17, 2004, Peter Bryan would strike again. He visited the home of Brian Cherry, a kind-hearted man who had befriended Peter through a mutual acquaintance. Cherry was a quiet, reclusive man who was often taken advantage of by others. Peter arrived at Cherry's flat in Walthamstow, East London, carrying a claw hammer, screwdriver, and a Stanley knife. Once inside, he launched a vicious attack on Cherry, striking him with the hammer 24 times before dismembering his body with the tools he had brought with him. Peter then proceeded to cook part of Cherry's brain in a frying pan with butter. When Cherry's friend, Nicola Newman, arrived at the flat later that evening, she was horrified to find Peter, bare-chested and sweating, with Cherry's mutilated body on the floor. Peter calmly told Nicola, Brian is dead. Sensing the danger she was in, Nicola quickly fled the apartment and called the police. When the authorities arrived, they found Peter Brian standing in the hallway with blood-stained clothes. In the kitchen, they discovered the grisly remains of Cherry's brain, which Peter had fried and eaten. When questioned by police, Peter chillingly admitted, I ate his brain with butter. It was really nice. He later added that he would have killed again if the police hadn't arrived when they did. Following his arrest for the murder of Brian Cherry, Peter Bryan was sent to Pentonville Prison. While there, he openly expressed his desire to kill again telling staff members that he wanted to murder them and eat their flesh. Because of the severity of his condition, Peter was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital, a high-security psychiatric facility. However, even in Broadmoor, Peter continued to pose a serious threat. On April 25, 2004, just two months after killing Brian Cherry, Peter murdered fellow patient Richard Lowell. Lowell, who was 60 years old, was awaiting trial for the murder of an elderly woman. He had been vilified by the other inmates, and Peter viewed him as a prime target. Despite being in a secure facility, Peter found an opportunity to attack Lowell. He strangled him to death in front of hospital staff. Peter Bryan's final murder prompted an urgent investigation into how someone as dangerous as he was could have been allowed to kill again while under constant supervision. The investigation revealed serious failings in the mental health and criminal justice systems. It was clear that Peter Bryan had manipulated his doctors into believing that he was no longer a threat, and the system had allowed him to walk free, with tragic consequences. Peter Bryan was a man whose life was marked by tragedy and violence. From a young age, he exhibited dangerous behavior that went unchecked. Despite numerous warning signs and several opportunities for intervention, Peter was able to commit three brutal murders. His case exposed serious flaws in the way mentally ill offenders were treated and raised questions about how the system could better protect society from individuals like Peter Bryan. Peter Bryan remains incarcerated in a high-security psychiatric hospital, where he is under constant supervision. His crimes serve as a stark reminder of the dangers posed by individuals who slip through the cracks of the criminal justice system leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. The quiet suburb of Frankston, nestled in the heart of Victoria, Australia, was once a place where families felt safe, where children played in the streets, and where doors were often left unlocked. But in 1993, that sense of security was shattered by a series of brutal murders that gripped the community in fear. Denier, a predator who stalked and killed without mercy, 
leaving a trail of blood and devastation in his wake. This story isn't just about the gruesome acts of a serial killer, it's about the lives that were tragically cut short, the community left in shock, and the chilling darkness that one man unleashed upon an unsuspecting town. Paul Charles Denier was born on April 14, 1972, in Campbelltown, New South Wales, Australia, into a seemingly ordinary family. He was one of six children in the Denier household, raised in a suburban environment that, at first glance, appeared typical. However, Denier's early life was marked by a series of troubling incidents that hinted at the darkness within him. His family relocated multiple times during his childhood, moving from New South Wales to Victoria, which disrupted his ability to form stable friendships or connections, and he became increasingly withdrawn. From an early age, Denier displayed signs of disturbing behavior. As a child, he exhibited extreme cruelty towards animals, a common red flag among future violent offenders. He would torture and kill household pets, seemingly deriving pleasure from their suffering. These acts were brushed aside by those around him as mere childhood mischief, but they were far more sinister in nature. Denier's obsession with violence grew as he entered his teenage years, and he developed an unhealthy fascination with weapons, especially knives, as well as dark, violent fantasies involving women. Academically, Denier struggled. He was a poor student, often isolated from his peers, and he showed little interest in schoolwork, or building social connections. His inability to connect with others only deepened his sense of alienation, and over time, this fostered an intense resentment towards women. He frequently experienced feelings of inadequacy and rejection, and these emotions would later manifest in his deadly rage. Denier's growing anger was further exacerbated by his inability to hold down a steady job or build meaningful relationships. After leaving school, he drifted through life, bouncing between low-paying jobs and never quite fitting in anywhere. His resentment and hatred toward women intensified, and he began to fantasize about taking out his frustrations through violence. By the time he reached adulthood, Denier's disturbing thoughts had fully consumed him. He nurtured a deep-seated hatred towards women, and this loathing became the driving force behind his brutal killing spree in 1993. His early life, filled with warning signs that were overlooked or ignored, culminated in the violent outburst that would shock Australia and leave an indelible mark on the community of Frankston. On the rainy night of June 11, 1993, 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens was on her way home, completely unaware that a predator had been watching her every move. As she stepped off the bus, Denier was waiting. Armed with a crude weapon and a terrifying determination, he forced Elizabeth to a dark, isolated park. Her last moments were filled with unimaginable terror as Denier strangled and stabbed her repeatedly. Even after her death, he mutilated her body in ways that revealed his deranged satisfaction, carving into her flesh as if it was nothing more than a game. Elizabeth Stevens was born in October 1975. She was a bright and compassionate 18-year-old with a gentle spirit. Growing up in the Melbourne suburb of Frankston, she had a love for animals and a natural curiosity about the world around her. After finishing high school, Elizabeth moved from her hometown in New South Wales to Melbourne to pursue her studies. At the time of her death, she was studying at the Chisholm Institute of Technology. Described by those who knew her as shy but warm-hearted, Elizabeth had dreams of making a difference in people's lives, and her future was full of promise. Elizabeth's murder sent ripples of fear through the community. But at that point, no one knew the true horror that lay ahead. People thought it was an isolated tragedy, a rare act of random violence. But Paul Denier wasn't finished. Far from it. Just a few weeks later, on July 8, 1993, Denier set his sights on Debbie Freem. Debbie was born in 1967. She was a loving 22-year-old mother and a kind-hearted woman. Raised in Melbourne, she led a life filled with joy and compassion. Deborah had recently given birth to her son and was excited about the new chapter of her life as a mother. She balanced motherhood and her work with grace and was known to be a reliable and devoted friend to those around her. Deborah had a deep passion for life and was always ready to offer a helping hand. 
Her gentle spirit and enthusiasm for being a mother made her an adored figure in her family and social circle. A new mother still in the first fragile days of bonding with her infant son. Debbie had left her 12-day-old baby with a friend to make a quick trip to the local milk bar, an errand she believed would take no more than a few minutes. But in those brief moments, Denier had already made his move. As Debbie returned to her car, he silently slipped into the back seat, waiting like a phantom in the dark. Unaware of the nightmare that was about to unfold, Debbie drove off, only to be confronted by Denier's chilling presence. He forced her to drive to a remote location, where her life was brutally cut short. Days later, her body was discovered, desecrated in a manner eerily similar to Elizabeth's, a grotesque signature left by a man with a monstrous need to destroy. As fear began to grip Frankston, the police realized they were facing a serial killer, someone whose appetite for violence seemed insatiable. The streets grew eerily quiet, the usual sense of suburban security shattered. But the terror escalated even further when Denier claimed his final victim. On July 30, 1993, 17-year-old Natalie Russell was walking home from school, taking the same shortcut she had taken so many times before. But this time, something was terribly different. Denier, driven by his unrelenting hatred, had been waiting, meticulously preparing to strike. He had cut holes in a fence near the path she walked setting a trap like a predator stalking prey. When Natalie crossed his path, Denier pounced, dragging her into the shadows and mercilessly ending her young life. Natalie Russell was born in 1975. She was a 17-year-old high school student from Langwarin, a suburb near Frankston. Known for her outgoing personality and radiant smile, Natalie was a dedicated student with big dreams for the future. She attended John Paul College, where she was excelling in her studies. Natalie had a close-knit group of friends who admired her kindness, intelligence, and sense of humor. She was looking forward to finishing her final year of high school and was passionate about sports and music. Natalie had a supportive family who encouraged her aspirations and were deeply proud of her achievements. The brutality of her murder shocked even seasoned investigators. Each stab wound and cut a reflection of the depths of Denier's rage. But Denier's carelessness would finally be his undoing. A postal worker, noticing his suspicious presence near the scene, reported his vehicle to the authorities. This critical lead sent the police straight to Denier. When confronted, he confessed without hesitation or remorse, describing his horrific acts with the chilling detachment of a man who saw his victims as mere objects to be destroyed. Denier admitted to threatening his victims with a crude homemade weapon and spoke of the pleasure he took in slitting their throats, each word a stark reminder of the evil that had lurked among them. Denier's arrest brought an end to the reign of terror, but the impact of his crimes would never fade. The families of Elizabeth Stevens, Debbie Freem, and Natalie Russell were left with a deep, indescribable loss, mothers, fathers, siblings, and friends mourning the futures that would never be. Paul Denier was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, where he remains to this day, a reminder of the monstrous cruelty humans are capable of. But the story doesn't end there. In an unsettling twist, Paul Denier is now eligible for parole. Despite the horrific nature of his crimes, the passage of time has given him the right to apply for release. He has already attempted once to walk free and was denied, but nothing stops him from trying again. The very thought of Denier being released sends shockwaves of anger and fear through the community. The families of his victims, still reeling from their devastating loss, now face the horrifying possibility that the man who shattered their lives could be given a second chance at freedom. Psychologists who have studied Denier's case are united in their grim assessment. He is still dangerous. Diagnosed with a personality disorder that has no known cure, Denier has shown no signs of change or remorse. In letters written from his cell, his lack of empathy and emotional void are evident. Experts, like forensic psychologist Carla Ferrari, believe that even with the best therapy available, any rehabilitation would be minimal at best. His potential for violence remains, lurking just beneath the surface. For the families of Elizabeth, Debbie, and Natalie, Paul Denier's parole hearings are a living nightmare. The thought that the man who ripped their loved ones from this world could once again walk free is unbearable. 
To them, and to the residents of Frankston, the only justice is for Denier to remain behind bars for the rest of his days, where he can no longer harm anyone. The risk is too high, and the price of another tragedy too devastating to even imagine. Frankston will never forget the seven weeks of terror that brought the town to its knees. The scars remain, etched into the memories of those who lived through it, a constant reminder of the evil that once walked among them. Paul Denier may have been caught and sentenced, but the scars of his horrific crime still linger in the hearts of those who lived through that dark chapter. The families of the victims, the Frankston community, and those who feared for their lives during those harrowing months will never forget the terror he wrought. But amid the tragedy, the resilience of the human spirit shines through. Frankston healed, and life carried on, though forever marked by the shadow of a man who showed no remorse, only cruelty. As we look back on this story, we remember the victims, honor their lives, and reflect on the horrifying reality that monsters sometimes dwell where we least expect them. In a world where love often dances on the edge of vulnerability and trust, the tragic tale of Marcus Johnson and Ebony Davis reveals how the darkest secrets can transform affection into devastation. Their seemingly idyllic marriage masked a hidden truth that, when exposed, ignited a horrific chain of events. What began as a passionate romance spiraled into a nightmare, culminating in a brutal murder that would shatter lives and ripple through their Houston community. This is the chilling story of betrayal, identity, and the heartbreaking consequences of deception. Marcus Johnson and Ebony Davis seemed like the perfect couple, their love story reminiscent of a romance novel that friends envied and strangers admired. Both were proud black Americans from the vibrant city of Houston, Texas, where they first crossed paths at a community event organized by their local church. Marcus, a tall, muscular 32-year-old construction worker, had deep ties to his family and community. Raised in a strict conservative household, he grew up with strong values and a sense of pride in being a provider, known for his dedication and hard work. His friends often joked that Marcus would take care of everyone before thinking of himself, a true protector, especially when it came to marriage. Ebony, on the other hand, was stunningly beautiful. At 28, she turned heads wherever she went, with her tall frame, glowing brown complexion, captivating dark eyes, and infectious smile. As a hairstylist, she was carving out a name for herself in the local beauty scene. Her confidence and charm drew people to her, but it was her warmth that made everyone feel special. It wasn't long before Marcus was drawn to her like a magnet. Their courtship was quick yet intense, surprising friends and family with its rapid pace. Within months, Marcus was bringing Ebony to every family gathering, proudly showing her off as the one who fits seamlessly into his life. In less than a year, Marcus proposed. Tears filled Ebony's eyes as she said yes without hesitation, and to the outside world, they were living a fairy tale. However, beneath the surface, cracks were forming, cracks that Marcus could not yet see but would soon become impossible to ignore. Their wedding day, held in the historic Houston Baptist Church, was a dream come true, attended by over 200 guests. The ceremony was perfect. Marcus stood at the altar, his heart racing as he watched Ebony glide down the aisle in her shimmering white gown, looking like a goddess. Yet even on that joyous day, subtle hints of unease began to surface. Ebony appeared distant at times, her gaze often lingering far away, lost in thought. When they exchanged vows, Marcus noticed her hands trembling ever so slightly. He brushed it off as wedding day nerves, not realizing that something deeper lay beneath. Their honeymoon in the Caribbean was luxurious, a time meant for romance. Yet, despite the beautiful surroundings, Marcus sensed that something held Ebony back. She would occasionally withdraw, her eyes taking on a distant look as if wrestling with something deep within. When he pressed her about what was bothering her, she quickly brushed it off, attributing it to stress or homesickness. Don't worry about me, baby, she would say, wrapping her arms around him and giving a smile that could melt his heart. But Marcus couldn't shake the feeling that Ebony was hiding something from him. As life moved forward, their routine settled into a small, 
cozy home on the outskirts of Houston, a quiet neighborhood that offered them the privacy they craved. Marcus spent his weekends working around the house while Ebony focused on growing her beauty business. It was the life Marcus had always dreamed of, the perfect wife, a comfortable home, and a bright future. Yet, as the weeks turned into months, unease crept into their relationship. Ebony became increasingly secretive, locking her phone whenever Marcus was around and disappearing for hours without explanation. She claimed to be working late and seeing more clients, but when Marcus dropped by the salon to surprise her, it was often empty. The excuses became frequent, meetings with friends he had never heard of, phone calls taken in hushed tones. Doubts began to grow in Marcus's mind, but he didn't want to believe that something was wrong. He loved Ebony deeply, and the thought of her keeping something from him felt like a knife twisting in his gut. He convinced himself he was overthinking it. After all, no relationship is perfect. However, the tension continued to mount. Intimacy became less frequent, and when it did occur, it felt strained. Ebony would often turn away, refusing to make eye contact, as if she were on the verge of revealing a truth she couldn't bring herself to share. It wasn't until one fateful night that everything unraveled. Marcus had always respected Ebony's privacy, but his growing doubts led him to do something he never thought he would, search through her belongings while she was out with friends. As he rifled through her drawers, looking for an explanation for the increasing distance between them, he stumbled upon a small box hidden in the back of the closet, tucked beneath piles of old clothes. Inside were documents that made his blood run cold. Among various papers was a birth certificate bearing a name he had never seen before, Elijah Davis. Confusion gripped him as he dug deeper and found medical records dating back years, detailing Ebony's transition from male to female. In that moment, Marcus's world stopped. The air felt as though it had been sucked out of the room. His hands trembled as the weight of the revelation crashed down on him. The woman he had married, the woman he had vowed to love and cherish, had kept this monumental secret from him. It wasn't just a secret. It was a betrayal of everything he believed in, everything he thought their relationship had been built upon. His mind raced with a mix of emotions, anger, confusion, heartbreak. How could she have hidden something so vital? The person he thought he knew felt like a stranger. For hours, Marcus remained alone in the house, the quiet ticking of the clock amplifying his growing rage and sense of betrayal. When Ebony finally returned home that evening, she was greeted by the sight of Marcus sitting on the edge of their bed, her most intimate secret laid bare before him. The moment her eyes fell on the documents, her face drained of color. She froze in the doorway, gripping the doorknob tightly as if preparing to run. You lied to me, Marcus's voice was barely a whisper, trembling with rage. Who are you? Ebony's heart sank as the reality of the situation hit her. She had always known this day might come, the day when her past would catch up with her, but she never imagined it would happen like this. Marcus, please, I was going to tell you, I swear, I didn't know how. I love you, this doesn't change who I am or who we are, she pleaded, stepping cautiously toward him, her eyes filling with tears. But her words only fueled Marcus's fire. It doesn't change who you are, you've been lying to me this whole time, you tricked me into marrying you, do you know what you've done? I gave you everything, my love, my loyalty, my life, and this whole time, you've been lying to me about the most basic thing, who you really are. Tears streamed down Ebony's face, but she held her ground, desperate to make him understand. I didn't tell you because I didn't want to lose you. You mean everything to me, I thought if you knew, you wouldn't love me anymore. Marcus's face twisted in fury. You thought right, he spat his anger spiraling out of control. The room felt like it was closing in on him. The woman he had loved now felt like a complete stranger. The argument grew more intense with every passing minute. Marcus's anger was like a live wire, unpredictable and volatile, while Ebony was trapped between trying to explain herself and fearing what Marcus might do next. Marcus, please, just calm down. We can talk about this. I'll answer any questions you have. Just please don't do anything rash. But Marcus wasn't hearing her anymore. In his mind, everything he had built with her had been a lie, and he couldn't think straight. All he saw was red, 
his hands clenched into fists, his breath quickening. In a blind moment of rage, Marcus stormed into the garage. His eyes landed on a hammer, and without hesitation, he grabbed it, returning to the house with chilling determination. As Ebony stood frozen in the bedroom, her eyes wide with fear, Marcus approached with the hammer in hand. Without warning, he swung it down with brutal force. Ebony screamed, trying to shield herself, but Marcus was relentless. Blow after blow, he struck her with terrifying fury. Her cries for mercy drowned out by his blind rage. The walls of their home were soon splattered with blood as Marcus continued the savage assault. The brutality of the attack was so severe that detectives later described it as one of the bloodiest crime scenes they had ever encountered. But Marcus didn't stop there. He dragged Ebony's lifeless body into the bathroom, his mind spiraling deeper into madness. He grabbed a knife from the kitchen drawer, and the rage took full control. Any sense of humanity vanished as he began to mutilate her body, slashing and cutting with reckless abandon, disfiguring her beyond recognition. By the time authorities arrived, Ebony's body was barely identifiable. Her face and body marred by Marcus's unhinged brutality. When the police finally broke through the door, the scene they encountered was nothing short of a nightmare. Blood soaked the walls and floor, and in the middle of the room sat Marcus, covered in blood, staring blankly at the horrific scene, surrounded by the aftermath of his brutal actions. Ebony's lifeless body lay nearby, a victim of his uncontrollable rage. Detectives quickly secured the scene and began to piece together the events leading up to the murder. Witnesses recounted hearing screams and the sound of objects being thrown, but no one could have anticipated the gruesome reality they were about to uncover. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that Marcus's violent outburst stemmed from a combination of betrayal and heartbreak. He was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, facing the possibility of life in prison. During the trial, evidence of his emotional turmoil and the brutal nature of the crime were presented, painting a picture of a man driven to madness by betrayal. The courtroom was filled with tension as details of their tumultuous relationship emerged, revealing the complexity of love, identity, and the consequences of secrets. Marcus's defense argued that he had acted out of a temporary insanity brought on by the shock of Ebony's revelation, but the prosecution maintained that his actions were premeditated. In the end, the jury found him guilty, sentencing him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The tragedy left a lasting impact on the community, sparking discussions about love, acceptance, and the devastating consequences of hidden truths. In the wake of the tragedy, family and friends struggled to come to terms with the loss of Ebony and the senselessness of her murder. The community mourned the loss of a vibrant woman who had touched many lives, her light extinguished far too soon. Meanwhile, Marcus's life lay in ruins, a stark reminder of how quickly love could turn into hate and how secrets could unravel even the strongest bonds. The shocking murder of Ebony Davis by Marcus Johnson serves as a haunting testament to the fragility of trust and the destructive power of hidden truths. As the echoes of their tumultuous relationship linger, the tragic fallout has left a community grappling with grief and confusion. Marcus, now imprisoned for life, is a stark reminder of how love, when tainted by deceit, can turn into an insatiable monster. Their story underscores the importance of honesty and acceptance, highlighting that the secrets we keep can lead to catastrophic consequences. In the end, it is a poignant reminder that the truth, however painful, is always better than a life veiled in lies. In the vibrant town of Manado, Argentina, where the picturesque landscape is adorned with colorful markets and the aroma of homemade delicacies fills the air, a love story unfolded that would captivate the community and eventually shatter it. Rolando Angel Aquino, a charismatic entrepreneur known for his infectious laughter and unwavering determination, had built a successful business from the ground up. Meanwhile, Karen Oviedo, a spirited woman with dreams of a fresh start, sought solace in the warmth of Rolando's embrace after enduring the pain of a previous heartbreak. Together, they appeared to be a match made in heaven, 
embodying the aspirations of young love and the promise of a future filled with hope. As the couple embarked on their journey together, they became symbols of ambition and romance, captivating the small town with their dreams of starting a family and expanding their business ventures. However, beneath the surface of their idyllic life lurked a sinister reality, one that would ultimately reveal the fragility of trust and the darkness that can seep into even the most vibrant of relationships. What began as a fairy tale soon spiraled into a chilling narrative of betrayal, deceit, and tragedy, culminating in a courtroom drama that would leave the community reeling and forever alter the lives of those involved. The haunting truth behind Rolando and Karen's love story would echo through the halls of justice, forcing everyone to confront the question, how far can love truly stretch before it snaps? Manado, a picturesque town nestled among the mountains of Argentina's Mendoza province, was known for its vibrant autumn hues, where streets were sprinkled with golden leaves and the peaks glimmered in shades of orange and red. Its residents shared joys and sorrows, their lives intertwined in a close-knit community. Here, Rolando Angel Aquino and Karen Oviedo began a romance that would ultimately shake the very foundations of Manado. Rolando, a man of striking magnetism, caught the eye of Karen, a woman with fire in her spirit and a zest for life that was infectious. Their connection was immediate, their dreams and ambitions mirroring one another. In 2016, they took the plunge, moving in together and launching their own business, a warehouse located in their home. Karen's meticulous attention to detail was evident in the charming sign she created for customer service, a symbol of their shared aspirations. As the couple thrived, their bond seemed unbreakable. However, the shadows of doubt crept in when Rolando discovered Karen in a car with another man. Anger flared, but he chose to forgive, convinced they could rebuild their relationship. To the outside world, they remained the embodiment of a perfect couple, but beneath the surface, cracks were forming. Rolando, born in Bolivia in 1987, was the eldest of seven children. He had always valued family and hard work, striving for a joyful household filled with laughter. His past included relationships that bore him two sons, yet he maintained amicable ties with their mothers. In Manado, he was known for his physical fitness and kindness, building rapport with neighbors who admired his charm. Karen, born on March 30, 1990, had spent her formative years in the very house where they established their warehouse. Outgoing and open-minded, she yearned for a loving family. However, her journey to happiness was fraught with difficulties. A previous marriage had resulted in two daughters, but financial strains forced her husband to abandon them. In the summer of 2019, tragedy struck when Elias, Rolando's son from a previous relationship, came to stay with them. Their future seemed bright until July 12, when Rolando found Elias unwell. A rush to the children's hospital revealed the boy's critical condition. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, Elias succumbed to a mysterious illness, diagnosed with third-degree poisoning that caused multi-organ failure and cerebral thrombosis. The couple was left devastated, grappling with the inexplicable loss of a child who had appeared perfectly healthy just hours before. As the months passed, Rolando and Karen leaned on each other for support, eventually marrying in late 2020. Yet, just over a year later, Rolando's health began to decline sharply. On February 7, 2022, after a night of apparent normalcy, he collapsed at home, succumbing to severe illness just two days later. The medical staff's suspicions were piqued when tests revealed elevated levels of calcium oxalate crystals, indicative of ethylene glycol poisoning, commonly found in antifreeze. The investigation into Rolando's death quickly intensified. Neighbors reported seeing Karen administering unknown substances to her husband, raising eyebrows about her behavior. As authorities delved deeper, they unearthed alarming inconsistencies in her accounts. While she claimed to have administered a remedy for skin blemishes through and for, the housekeeper disputed this, stating she had never witnessed such a procedure. As the investigation unfolded, forensic analyses revealed a darker truth. Karen had conducted online searches for the deadliest poisons, including two orders for ethylene glycol. With mounting evidence against her, the prosecutor's office charged her with the willful poisoning of Rolando alleging that she had diluted the toxin in orange juice. 
The shocking revelations left the community in disbelief. A couple once seen as the epitome of love and partnership was now embroiled in a tragic saga of betrayal and loss. The heart-wrenching irony of a love story turned sinister echoed through the streets of Manado, leaving the townspeople grappling with the duality of human relationships. How love can transform into something unrecognizable when overshadowed by greed and desperation. As the courtroom awaited the verdict, it was not just a judgment against one woman but a reflection of the darkness that can lurk within even the most seemingly perfect relationships. The echoes of betrayal and the quest for truth would resonate long after the gavel fell, marking a new chapter in the history of Manado, a chapter forever tainted by tragedy. On December 1, 2022, the popular jury convened for the session found Karen Oviedo guilty of simple homicide and aggravated homicide. For all this, she was sentenced to the maximum penalty in Argentina, that is, life imprisonment. The heartbreaking case of Rolando Angel Aquino and Karen Oviedo serves as a poignant reminder of the complexities of love and the dark shadows that can lurk within even the most seemingly perfect relationships. As the dust settled after the courtroom revelations, the vibrant town of Manado was left grappling with the devastating aftermath of betrayal and loss. What began as a tale of ambition and romance transformed into a chilling narrative of despair forcing the community to confront the fragility of trust and the harsh reality that love can sometimes conceal the darkest of secrets. Ultimately, the story of Rolando and Karen is a cautionary tale, a powerful exploration of how love, when intertwined with ambition and desire, can lead to unexpected and tragic consequences. In a world where appearances can be deceiving, it reminds us to look beyond the facade, to recognize the signs of distress and to understand that even the strongest bonds can fracture under pressure. As the community moves forward, their story serves as a solemn warning. Love can be both a sanctuary and a battleground, and it is essential to nurture the trust that binds us before it slips away forever. Christmas Eve a night filled with warmth, laughter, and the promise of a new year. But for L. Edwards, this festive evening turned into a scene of unimaginable horror. In a brutal and senseless act of violence, the 26-year-old was shot in the head while celebrating with friends at a local pub in Wallasey. What should have been a night of joy was shattered by gunfire, leaving L.'s lifeless body on the floor, and her loved ones in utter despair. This was no random crime. It was a targeted attack that claimed the life of an innocent woman, shaking an entire community to its core. In this video, we uncover the chilling details of L. Edwards' cold-blooded murder and the relentless pursuit of justice for her untimely death. L. Edwards was born in 1996 and grew up in Merseyside, England. She was raised in a loving family and had a close relationship with her parents and siblings. Elle was known for her kind and caring nature, making her well-loved by those who knew her. The young girl was a dental nurse as well as a cosmetologist at Nova Studio Beauty Salon. Her colleagues and many clients adored her. Tim Edwards Elle's father described her as wonderful, beautiful, and kind. She always looking out for others, particularly her family bubbly and always had a good laugh. She set her own goals and was achieving them with a positive attitude. On the evening of December 24, 2022, Elle and her sister went to the Lighthouse pub. She was supposed to meet her friends and their surveillance cameras caught Ellie's evening activities. She was in a good mood, hugging her friends and smiling. They danced, sang, and had a great time. Police received multiple reports of a shooting shortly after 11.50 p.m. Soon, police officers surrounded the area. Someone had fired at least 12 shots at the patrons of the pub where Elle was meeting friends. Sue Coombs, detective superintendent told a news conference on Christmas Day. Tragically, the victim, a 26-year-old woman sustained a serious gunshot wound to the head. She was taken to Arrow Park Hospital but unfortunately died shortly after. Her family has been notified and they are dealing with this tragic loss on a day that should have been spent celebrating with friends. Witnesses described a gunman firing shots into the pub's front entrance before fleeing in a dark vehicle. L. Edwards was the victim of the shooting. 
The police did not believe L was the intended target of the attack which also injured four men. A 28-year-old man from a nearby Beechwood was treated for serious injuries while the other men aged 22 and 33 sustained non-life-threatening injuries. Elle's tragic death presented an unimaginable and heartbreaking challenge for her family. Tim Edwards awoke early on Christmas morning to the worst news any parent could ever hear. Meanwhile, the police were working tirelessly to apprehend and prosecute the criminal. They needed CCTV footage and witnesses who could share important information on Facebook. Merseyside Police Detective Superintendent David McCarran stated, We have a number of officers at Wallasey Village who are conducting extensive investigations to determine what happened and take immediate action. I would urge anyone who was in the lighthouse in Wallasey Village last night and witnessed the incident or has mobile or CCTV footage of what happened to contact us immediately as they may have vital information for our investigation. We believe the gunman left the pub parking lot in a dark-colored vehicle, possibly a dark-colored Mercedes shortly after the shooting and we would like to hear from anyone who witnessed this to contact us right away. The police knew the criminal had fled the scene in a dark Mercedes. They discovered this information after reviewing CCTV footage. The driver parks the car to see who is inside the establishment and leave as soon as possible. The man observed everyone for a while. He then got out of the car and approached from the side to remain invisible. Moments later, he fired 12 shots, dashed to his Mercedes, and fled the crime scene. The police began patrolling the streets near where the shooting occurred. Officers went from one door to the next interviewing residents. Two days later, police announced the arrest of two suspects, but did not reveal their names. They were a 30-year-old man and a 19-year-old woman who were eventually released. According to the authorities' statement, the arrested man did not fire the shots. The police spokesman stated unequivocally, We will not rest until the offenders are brought to justice. And by that I mean, the person who pulled the trigger of the gun in the most indiscriminate manner. Anyone who was responsible for arranging, facilitating, or harboring this individual, and anyone who continues to withhold information on who did this or where the weapon is. We will work tirelessly to find justice for Elle and her family. The shooting was reportedly the result of a feud between two local rival gangs. It confirmed Elle was a random victim and asked if he could directly link the shooting to a gang feud in Worrell. Critchley stated that there has been some escalation in this area over the last few months. The detectives determined that Jake Duffy and Kieran Sockold were the intended targets of this attack. The police arrested a third suspect in this case, but he was not the one who fired shots at the Lighthouse pub's patrons. The man whose name was kept public was charged with conspiracy to commit a crime. The police were also able to locate the criminal's dark Mercedes, which he used to flee the crime scene, but the vehicle had some issues. CCTV footage from the evening of December 31st, a week following Elle's death, the criminal knew that the police were only a few steps away from apprehending him, so he burned the Mercedes to destroy any evidence that the police might find there during a search. The Mercedes had become a pile of burned metal, but the police were able to identify it. It turned out that the criminal stole this car, most likely to use it to commit a crime. Almost two weeks later, on January 11th, Police announced the arrest of two additional suspects. They arrested a 22-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman in Central Wales. The man was named Connor Chapman and he had a lengthy criminal record. In a matter of years, Chapman went from petty criminal to the main suspect in L. Edwards' death. Aggravated carjacking, threatening behavior, burglary, disorderly conduct and a high-speed chase that ended with him hiding in the bushes and telling officers he was waiting for his mate. Growing up in the woods, he spent most of his time in Birkenhead with his grandparents. Chapman went to Woodchurch High School but left before taking his exams. He first appeared in court in 2014 when he was around 14 years old for shoplifting. In 2016, the young man faced criminal charges for being on enclosed property and driving a stolen car. Next. He violated his conditional discharge by driving without a license or insurance. Then, in 2017, he was charged with car theft, illegal substance possession, and violating a criminal behavior order which barred him from traveling to certain parts of the world. In 2018, 
The police detained him again for possessing a prohibited substance and carrying a cold weapon in public. During the same year, the general public became aware of Chapman's name after he first appeared strangely on the pages of local newspapers. After an unsuccessful attempt to flee a police chase, officers noticed the stolen Audi and attempted to stop it, but the driver disobeyed. Chapman, who was 18 at the time, was speeding at 60 miles per hour in a 30 amp zone while attempting to escape. He flew into oncoming traffic and then crashed into a curb forcing him to abandon the car and flee. When the police discovered him hiding in the nearby bushes, he stated, I'm waiting for my mate. Chapman's lawyer claims he is influenced by older peers and has struggled with his own health issues. Chapman admitted to reckless driving, aggravated vehicle theft, driving while disqualified, and violating a criminal behavior order. The court sentenced him to eight months in a young offender's institute and a two-year four-month driving ban passing the sentence. Recorder Mary Lauren told him pointedly, You have a bad record despite your youth and you have been given every opportunity. You show no regard at all. Other people with this diagnosis do not behave in the same way that you do. They do not cause a nuisance to the public in the same way that you do. By the age of 18, he had 14 convictions for 30 offenses. As a result, it is reasonable to assume that this man had no intention of improving his situation. Unfortunately, there were no legal grounds to keep him isolated from society for a long time. In January 2020, the court sentenced him to 10 months in prison for possessing stolen goods and carrying a cold weapon in public. According to records, Merseyside police issued public appeals for information on his whereabouts on five separate occasions while he was a wanted man. Chapman once claimed that he was in custody more than he was out. By the age of 20, Chapman had 19 convictions for 43 offenses. In summer 2022, he got out of prison. Chapman turned out to be a member of a local gang. He sold illegal drugs, robbed another home, and stole two electric motorcycles. But his most heinous and devastating crime was yet to occur. On December 24, 2022, during a dispute between organized crime groups based on the Wood Church and Beechwood Estates, Chapman armed himself with a Scorpion submachine gun. He waited for Kieran Sockled and Jake Duffy, members of the rival gang outside Wallace East Lighthouse pub for three hours. Chapman fired 12 shots just before midnight. Both Sockled and Duffy were seriously injured, but they survived. Unfortunately, when Chapman fired the gun, L. Edwards, who was enjoying the evening with close friends, was next to Sockled when two bullets struck her in the head. She didn't know Sockled or Duffy. She just happened to be present during an attack on them. On January 25, 2023, family, friends, and hundreds of others attended L. Edwards' funeral. Locals lined the streets in the rain as mourners arrived for the 12.30 p.m. service. The funeral procession was led by a hearse with a floral tribute stating that L.'s coffin was transported in a carriage pulled by four white horses. Pallbearers, including her heartbroken father, Tim, carried it into the church topped with a floral display. Her grandfather, George, delivered a message to the mourners encouraging them to leave the church with hope. The lighthouse pub was closed that day as a mark of respect. According to a statement posted on the pub's Facebook page, Elle and her family have been on our minds for several weeks. This is especially true right now. May she rest peacefully. Tim stated that he hoped to establish a foundation in his daughter's name to help reduce gun violence. He stated that there are no winners in gun crime. If you pick up a gun, your future and the futures of those around you are over. It's dead simple. It's completely pointless and solves nothing. Connor Chapman was charged with numerous offenses including causing the death of L. Edwards, but he had an accomplice. Police charged 20-year-old Thomas Waring with possessing a prohibited weapon and assisting an offender. The detectives discovered that after shooting at the Lighthouse pub's guests, Chapman drove the stolen Mercedes to Barnston, Merseyside where his longtime friend Thomas Waring lived. The surveillance camera that captured Chapman walking down the road and picking up the crime scene weapon after it had fallen to the ground. Although the crime weapon was never found, 
police discovered Chapman's DNA in a mixed sample on a bullet casing discovered at the scene and a red glove recovered from Waring's home which matched one worn by the gunman in a taxi ordered under a false name. Around 5 a.m., Chapman returned home to Woodchurch, Merseyside via a vague pickup point on Christmas morning. To cover up their heinous crime, the men drove to a remote location on New Year's Eve and set fire to a stolen Mercedes. Thomas Waring was found guilty on all charges. In July 2023, the court sentenced him to nine years in prison. Jake Duffy and Kieran Sockled were the targets of the attack. They were both wounded but survived. In this case, they were the victims. However, a closer look at their way of life reveals that they were on a dangerous path. They were part of the Beechwood Gang. On December 23, 2023, Chapman had injured them the day before at the Lighthouse Pub. Duffy and Sockle beat up another criminal affiliated with a group that included Connor Chapman. While Chapman was awaiting sentencing in the shooting case, the two were already imprisoned for their crimes. Sockle received a 27-month sentence for assault, and nine months for being afraid to run concurrently. Duffy was sentenced to two years for assault, and nine months for a fray that would run concurrently. The court has also issued injunctions against them. Commenting on the injunctions, Chief Inspector Tom Welch stated that gang-related activity has a profoundly negative impact on those who live or work in areas where these criminals conduct their business often recklessly and with complete disregard for others. The gang injunctions served on Duffy and Sockheld are part of the ongoing and relentless efforts to combat serious and organized crime in Birkenhead. The local officers are well aware of the prohibitions detailed in these injunctions and they will strictly enforce them. If either man violates the law, police can act quickly to arrest him and return him to court where he may face prison time. Investigators are using all available powers and legislation to disrupt and deter gang activity but they can't do it alone. They need communities to report any criminal activity in their area so that they can get criminals off the streets. Before the story of the shooting began, the court prohibited Chapman from entering the area surrounding the Lighthouse pub. Nonetheless, he chose precisely this location to commit the crime that resulted in the death of the innocent young woman. Connor Chapman denied everything. He claimed that the camera at the Lighthouse pub captured another man, not him. He claimed he was at home wrapping Christmas presents, but the evidence suggests otherwise. During the three and a half week trial, the jury heard about events leading up to the incident including a feud between Chapman's Woodchurch, a state-based gang, and a rival group centered on the Beechwood estate which is home to Sockled and Duffy. Investigators discovered that after committing the crime, Chapman planned to flee to Spain by car ferry. Before he could do that, the police searched his grandparents' home and the man knew they were close to catching him. As a result, he chose to flee to Wales rather than risk his life on a car ferry. That is where the plainclothes officers later arrested him. During the trial, Chapman admitted to having access to the Mercedes scene on CCTV footage but stated that it was primarily used by him and other gang members to trade illegal drugs. He claimed other people had access to the Mercedes and that he wasn't driving it that evening. He admitted to burning the car but said he did so after realizing someone from his gang had used it in the shootout. Outside court, L's father, Tim, expressed his hope that his daughter's killer would never see Christmas again. If I'm lucky enough to be around for a long time, I'll do everything I can to ensure that he never leaves jail. He stated that the jury of seven women and five men reached a unanimous decision. Following three hours and 48 minutes of deliberation and three and a half weeks of trial at Liverpool Crown Court, they found Chapman guilty. On July 7, 2023, the court sentenced Connor Chapman to life in prison with a minimum of 48 years before he could seek parole. During the verdict announcement, Elle's family breathed a sigh of relief and whispered yes. Her father, Tim Edwards, also went on air to answer questions from journalists. Tim said some crucial words. I believe Elle's legacy will hopefully inspire people to be more positive. The murder of Elle Edwards was a heartbreaking reminder of how quickly a life can be taken in a senseless act of violence. A young woman, full of life and surrounded by those who loved her, was cruelly stolen from her family and friends on what should have been a night of celebration. While justice may bring some solace, it can never erase the pain of losing Elle in such a brutal and tragic way. 
Her story is a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the devastating consequences of violence. As we remember Elle, we also reflect on the need for communities to come together, to stand against senseless violence, and to ensure that no other family has to endure the pain and loss that hers has suffered. Elle Edwards may be gone, but her memory lives on, a beautiful soul, taken too soon, but never forgotten. If you found this helpful, please click the thumbs up button and subscribe to catch more videos. You may also leave any questions or suggestions you'd like to see me cover in future videos in the comments section.